Hello class, welcome back. Today we want to talk about issues related to biblical interpretation. And this lecture will be based on uh, material from Leo Garrett's Systematic Theology, Volume 1. The first thing we want to talk about under biblical interpretation is something called biblical criticism. And that's not necessarily a negative thing. Biblical criticism is defined by Garrett as the application of the principles of textual, literary, and historical criticism to the books of the Bible. Now, there are different methods of biblical criticism, some more problematic, others less so. The first one we want to talk about is textual criticism. Textual criticism. Uh, this is oftentimes referred to as lower criticism. Textual criticism is the task of ascertaining the most accurate text of the Old or New Testaments by comparing all of the available manuscript evidence and applying certain rules of evidence to the various manuscripts and manuscript families. Now this has mostly been done with the New Testament uh, because of the, the wide availability of manuscripts we have with the New Testament. But in, in just in the last few years, new questions <clears throat> are being raised about the textual history of the Old Testament because the Hebrew text that we use today is called the Masoretic text and it is the text that was standardized by the Jewish rabbis in AD 1000. Now in the last lecture we talked about assuming the historical dates of Moses uh, around 1400 BC to 1000 AD, we're talking 2,400 years, roughly. Would that be right? I think that would be right. And uh, we have the only, the only Hebrew witness we have in between that are the Dead Sea Scrolls that are dated to about 200 BC. So about Let's see, 1,400 minus 800. I can't do that kind of math. That's negative integers. Anyway, you get the picture. It's a long time. But when they compare the Dead Sea Scrolls to the Masoretic text, which would be another 1,200 years later, uh, there's a high degree of, uh, of, um, of similarity and accuracy. But there are certain places where there are differences. And then you take and you compare that uh, data to the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament that was made before Christ. And, and you start to get a feel for some questions uh, related to the transmission history of the Hebrew Old Testament. And some are suggesting that at least in certain places, the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Septuagint may preserve a more accurate reading than does the Masoretic text. As a matter of fact, some have argued that the rabbis perhaps altered the Masoretic text deliberately to make it different from the Christian text. And uh, I'll leave it to you to research that if you want to. But that is a part of the work of textual criticism, deciding, figuring out what the text originally said. And we talked last time about why that's important from a perspective of biblical inerrancy. We need to know what God said. Now, forms of higher criticism uh, involve literary criticism, which looks at the historical background, questions of authorship, date, audience, and literary form or genre, as well as linguistic problems and possible sources used in writing the books of the Bible. Uh, it is uh, rather skeptical of, of the traditional views of date and authorship of the books of, of the Bible, especially of the Old Testament. Form criticism assumes that certain oral forms uh, lay behind the final written form of the biblical material and seeks to understand the books of the Bible from their sitzim leben, or setting in life, uh, for the believing community. Redaction criticism examines the theological mindset or drive of the biblical writer and the editorial process he used in compiling his material to promote a specific theological concept. This has been used most widely with the synoptic gospels uh, and, and is especially important with regard to Luke's gospel because Luke tells us openly that he interviewed people and used many sources to compile his gospel. 
So how do we assess biblical criticism? Textual criticism is based on the study of available historical materials, the manuscripts, and so has an objective basis. Other forms of criticism, higher criticism as it's called, uh, are based on more subjective factors, especially the presuppositions of the persons employing the method. And remember, in this regard, your presuppositions will determine your end product. So if you approach the text with the presupposition that supernatural revelation does not happen, you will conclude with the, uh, with the, the proof, if you will, that these books were not supernaturally inspired as the biblical text says they were, because that's where you started and that's where you're going to end. Your presupposition will determine your end product. So let's talk for a moment about methods of interpretation. Methods of interpretation are biblical hermeneutics. Uh, first, there are older methods of interpretation. There's the typological. It's a very early form of biblical interpretation. It assumes that there are types or symbols in the Old Testament that foreshadow their fulfillment in the New Testament. This form of interpretation is found in the New Testament writers, particularly in the book of Hebrews, as well as the Christian writers of the second century. There is the allegorical interpretation, the belief that there are hidden spiritual meanings in the text. Uh, origin built on a foundation laid by Clement of Alexandria, a threefold method of interpretation, the literal, the moral, and the spiritual. Augustine allowed for four levels of meaning, the historical, the etiological or causes, the analogical, which harmonizes the Old and New Testaments, and the allegorical or figurative. Then there is the dogmatic uh, method, which draws on doctrinal concepts from outside the text under consideration to affirm specific doctrinal teachings. In other words, it begins with a doctrine and then finds it in the text. There is the historical critical method. This method, uh, uh, which is a newer method, seeks to interpret a text in view of lexical, grammatical, syntactical, comparative lexical, author-related, literary, comparative, religious, secular, historical, and other factors to see the text as far as possible in the light of its total context and situation. This is from Garrett, page 147. Contributions of this method. Uh, interpretation begins in the foreign world of the biblical writers. That's where we've got to start. We've got to start our interpretive process with where the biblical writers lived. It reminds us that interpretation should be done in context. The Puritans had a saying, a text without a context is a pretext. We must interpret text in its context to understand it. Uh, the passage has only one meaning, not many. This challenges the notion of the census planor, that the idea that the text has multiple, uh, sometimes competing memories. Uh, it reminds us that God's revelation in the Bible is situationally continued, and so is progressive in nature. And distinctions must be made between the culturally conditioned aspect and the timeless eternal application of the text. There are alien presuppositions conditioning the use of the historical critical method, though, and these must be kept in check. Uh, positivism, uh, all knowledge, this is the idea that all knowledge comes by direct observation. It denies the metaphysical aspect, the supernatural, and it sees the Bible as a totally human book simply written by people reflecting their experience of religion. Uh, historicism, this is the notion of history uh, of any subject that can account for its nature and values completely. It denies divine causation and denies the supernatural. And so we have to be careful of these. Recent criticism of the historical critical method involves the following. The method has failed to present the Bible as a single divine and human work. It chops up the Bible into multiple, multiple things. Uh, the method has not been able to take hold of the person structure of scripture. The method has tipped away from the conclusion that the Bible is divine revelation. And so it, 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 it becomes an entirely natural product. It's just another book.
What are the present alternatives and proposals for the adoption of a new hermeneutical method? Uh, there's the existentialist method. Focus on the situation of the modern man. This is somewhat the neo-orthodox approach. There's the structuralist method. Focus on the various structures of the text and the significance they impose upon the audience. This is a secular approach to the interpretation of the text. Meyer offers a historical biblical method. The Bible is a book in its own class. Uh, it shouldn't be judged on a standard with other books. Uh, God's sovereignty over human mental reservations must be observed. Scripture interprets itself. This minimizes subjectivism. In other words, you compare different parts of Scripture on the same theme uh, to aid in interpretation. Uh, emphasize the congregation's experience of the unity of Scripture. We must, we must remember that all interpretation should be done in the context of the community of faith. Any given text is to be seen in the context of the canon. We need to look at a passage in its immediate context and its larger situation within, uh, say, something that Paul said within larger, the larger context of Paul's writings, then the New Testament, and then the whole of the Bible. Uh, it, there's a stress on God's message to all humanity through the text. There are here proposals for the transformation or reformation of the historical critical method. Uh, Ladd advocates a biblical critical work by evangelical scholars that, that uh, the evangelical scholars undertake uh, the task of biblical critical work. Newport uh, has an approach that is centered on salvation history. How do we interpret the text in light of salvation history? So what are key issues in interpretation? Well, we have the sender, the medium, and the receiver. So the sender is the biblical writer inspired by the Holy Spirit. The medium is the text itself and the receiver is the person reading or hearing the text. This is the, this is the communication continuum. Where does the meaning lie? This is the question. In the 20th century, reader response interpretation became very significant in literary circles. Reader response puts meaning in the mind of the receiver. Uh, the text has whatever meaning that the receiver constructs from the text. The historical critical uh, method puts meaning in the text itself. E.D. Hirsch advocates authorial intent when interpreting a text and this places the meaning in the hands of the sender so that, for instance, when Paul writes to the church at Corinth, the meaning of what Paul has to say is not left up to what the Corinthians want to do with it. The meaning is based on what Paul intended to communicate to the Corinthians. And it is up to the Corinthians to then respond positively or negatively to what Paul wanted to say. There's an interesting story about the power of this method. Uh, one uh, literary interpreter wrote uh, a book and uh, he, and this, uh, this author was a big advocate of the reader response method of interpretation and E.D. Hirsch, who was an English professor, wrote a review of it in a journal. And in the review, he applied a reader response approach to the text to which the author responded, you completely misunderstood and misrepresented my book. And E.D. Hirsch's response was one word, exactly. Exactly. Uh, reader response doesn't work in the real world. So what are the principles of authorial intent? Well, you start with the intended meaning by the author. What did the author intend to communicate? For instance, Paul says in Ephesians, he says, do not be drunk with wine. What does he mean? He means don't get drunk with wine. Well, what is the range of meaning that's possible based upon the intended meaning? The larger range of meaning is don't be drunk. Just don't be drunk. That brings up the significance. The significance is the possible avenues of application. How can we apply this in our specific situations? These are, the, these are the avenues of application. And then, that is the significance. 
Then the application itself is what you as an individual will do with the meaning and significance of the message. So if we take Paul's text as an example, will you get drunk or will you not? Now, will you get drunk or will you be filled with the Holy Spirit? And this is how authorial intent uh, approach works in interpretation. And so that covers our lecture on interpretation.